This week's episode is brought to you by the Communa Cruise. It's a four-day Bahaman cruise leaving from Port Canaveral on December 5th, 2016, visiting Nassau, Castaway Key, and a day at sea. Email Communicore Weekly at fairygodmothertravel.com for more info and to book today. Hello and welcome to Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show and home of the world's first pair of independently born identical twins. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And you know what I really want to do, George? Eat a churro? Aside from eat a churro, I mm. want to go to Middle America and visit Marceline, Missouri again. Ooh, yeah, I'd like to visit it for the first time. You should, you should, you should, because there's a lot of historical time. context going on there. Or something like that. You don't, don't you mean historical? Hi- historical, that's right. Hyster- histor- hysterical? His- historical? Hysterical? I don't know. Something I'm, like I'm that. confused. Anyway. But we are going to talk about Marceline today. So Sweet. Let's do that. It's time for Disney History. Nostalgia has always played an important part of the Walt Disney and Disneyland and just the Walt Disney uh, Disney Studio story. And many of the films and shows produced by the studio, such as Johnny Tremaine and Davy Crockett, they all related tales of days gone by. And as soon as you walk into literally any Disney theme park of the world, you're transported to a turn-of-the-century American town, whether it's Main Street USA or the World Bazaar. So Walt obviously knew the power of nostalgia so well because it had the had quite a hold on him. You know, we all know Walt had attributed many of his philosophies and forward-thinking ideals to his childhood experiences in Marceline, Missouri. Though he only spent four years there, it definitely shaped what he was to become in many of the products that the Walt Disney Company would produce. Can you imagine how different it would have been if the Disney family stayed in Chicago? Luckily for us, with urban growth and, unfortunately, violence uh, forcing Elias and Flora to seek greener passage, uh, passages, um, Elias's brother actually had 45 acres of land to sell, and the Walt Disney story turned out the way it did because of that, benefiting us all. But life in rural Missouri wasn't easy, especially when you were of working age, especially in the Disney family. You know, the life that they were leading depended on successful form- farming operation, and Elias himself required himself and his three eldest, uh, Herbert, Raymond, and Roy, to work long hours in the fields. Herbert and Raymond hated this life and and longed for their old one back in Chicago. One night, the two of them secretly hopped on a train, leaving it all behind, and leaving most of the burden to fall on their brother Roy. But for Walt and his younger sister Ruth, Marceline uh, provided an idyllic childhood setting. Since Walt was too young to work in the fields, he was assigned to watching his little sister. The two of them spent hours beneath a gigantic uh, cottonwood tree near their house, and Walt would tell his sister stories about whatever came to his head, pretty much flexing his imagination to the extreme. And this spot became known as the Dreaming Tree, and was home to many of Walt's finest childhood memories. The two unintentionally got into some mischief once when they found a barrel of tar, and they decided to paint the side of the family's house with it. Ruth drew a zigzag pattern, while Walt made little houses with smoke coming from the chimneys, and it wasn't until later that Walt and Ruth realized that their artwork wouldn't easily wash off. In fact, it stayed there until the family moved, since Elias couldn't get it off either. So Elias spoke of this incident years later and said it was the first time he realized his son's creativity and showed these early signs of his success. However, Walt and Ruth had a very different view of it, and Walt was credited as saying to a magazine, the family did not thank me for my efforts when they asked him about it. <laughs> Another example of Walt's budding creativity, and one that did not land him in trouble, was when Doc Sherwood found Walt by his barn, attempting to draw his horse, Rupert. Instead of Walt getting in trouble for trespassing, Doc Sherwood instead offered to pay for the completed drawing. Walt finished it up and happily made his first sale. 
his artistic career had begun. Among his other activities while in Marceline, uh, there was fishing in Yellow Creek, uh, playing in the hayloft of his family barn, and observing the local wildlife. But he also had some chores to complete, such as caring for the family's chickens and pigs. But Walt always managed to make these tasks fun, like when moving the pigs from one pen to the other, he would jump on one's back and ride it into the next pen. And how do we not get a pig riding attraction at Disneyland? I, I don't know. I, it would be right yeah. at home on Main Street. It would be. So he also enjoyed visits to Uncle Mike Martin, who worked as an engineer for the Santa Fe Railroad. Uncle Mike always stayed with the family when his route stopped off in Marceline, and Walt loved his stories about life on the rails, you know, kickstarting a passion that would last him the rest of his life. However, in life, all good things must come to an end. So by 1910, this chapter was coming to a close for the Disney family. The farm's dwindling prospects forced the family to sell and move to Kansas City. And Walt actually still recalled the day that his father and Roy went through the town, putting up for sale signs and how heartbroken he was about it. And even though he just spent four years in Marceline, it stuck with him. The lessons and values he learned uh, there would end up resonating throughout his entire life. Even his first studio animated shorts were about barnyard hijinks, leading back to these early days of Marceline. Walt's philosophy of never doing anything halfway was strongly rooted in Marceline values. He always wanted to put forth the studio's best work no matter what, and often spent long hours himself or with his animators to make something special. This came from one particular event during his time in Marceline. Walt had once invited his friends over to his barn for an impromptu circus. He charged them 10 cents apiece to see it, and went to town. He had cats jumping out of a burlap sack as the big final act. Needless to say, his guests were not pleased with what they had spent money on. Flora heard her son's friends complaining and made Walt give back all the money he had taken as admission. Obviously, you know, when you're a kid, giving money back, that's a hard lesson to learn, especially for Walt. <laughs> But it was a necessary one. And if you give your audience quality entertainment, they will never leave unsatisfied. That was his takeaway from it. You know, they would want to come back for more after that. So after that, Walt never took shortcuts again, whether it was a circus in his barn or a film that he was releasing, uh, releasing nationwide. Of course, this showed in his work with all of their films and theme parks. And as such, Walt Disney never forgot his time in Marceline. And of course, Marceline did not forget Walt Disney. Either. So next week, we'll, we'll look at when Walt came back to Marceline a few times and how they honored their favorite son. But before, before we get to part two, or the book of the week, <laughs> we'd like to know what you think about Marceline. Have you ever had the chance to visit where Walt spent many of his formative years? Give us a call on the Communicore Weekly Goat Line at 424-785-4628. That's 424-785-GOAT. He's a nerd, he's a, nerd. He's a geek, he's a geek. But we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his beat. Ah! It's George's book of the week. Disney has released several picture books over the past few years to coincide with the re-releases of animated films or, you know, like live action film tie-ins. We've seen Cinderella with text by Cynthia Ryland and Peter Pan by Dave Barry. And Alice in Wonderland has just been released with text by John Siaska and art by Mary Blair. Like the other releases I just mentioned, Mary Blair's concept art is the basis for the book. So this time around, uh, this Alice book is actually a re-release from an earlier one, just in time for the new Alice in Wonderland live action film. And while usually we might say something like, mm, meh, we've been there before, we've seen it before, <laughs> You really can never go wrong with Mary Blair's art. Um, the original book came out in 2008, and with this one, uh, it has a new cover, and it's dated uh, 2016. So I guess it was about time? Yeah, I think so. And, you know, we have nothing at all against John Siaska, but the real reason to pick up Alice in Wonderland is simply for Mary Blair's stunning concept artwork. John is a well-known children's author, and he's most famous for his 1992 book, The Stinky Cheese Man. But... Anyway, 
uh, John's story is is rather stripped down and you know, just focuses on Blair's art that's used in the book. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just sort of like the cliff notes for the film. Which, again, is totally okay with us. I mean, the re-release uh, of the book kind of justifies buying a copy and then not feeling too bad about wanting to cut the pages out of the book and hang it on your wall because, again, Mary Blair art. I mean, it's, it's all gorgeous. You can't go wrong. It looks pristine and will just give us more Mary Blair art, please. Please? Please. Yes, definitely. Um, Alice in Wonderland is 64 pages with artwork on every spread, some of them taking up two full pages. So there are at least 30 works of Mary Blair's art. So if you're going to buy a copy to cut out and frame, you might, might need to buy two copies, and then you'll need one to keep because you'll have to get front and back. So three copies? Let's just go out on a limb and say four copies just to play it safe. You never know. Okay, because that's a nice even number. Yeah, of course. Okay, we'll do that, yeah. But regardless, I mean, I, I think I spoke. I speak for both of us when I say I hope they continue to release books featuring uh, the original concept work of Mary Blair. And not just Mary Blair, just I guess all like the original concept art because mm-hmm. it's, it's gorgeous. It's a good way to get it out there. And, you know, John does a great job of conveying the story into its simplest points, as George said, but it's really the artwork that's on display here. Exactly. So this week's book was Alice in Wonderland with text by John Sieska and art by Mary Blair. You don't know what you know till we know you. You just don't know. There's one little fact we bet you didn't. One little fact we bet you didn't know. Ever notice the one-story building on Hotel Boulevard between Wyndham Lake Buena Vista Resort and the Best Western Lake Buena Vista Resort? Well, it's currently the headquarters for the Amateur Athletic Union, but it always wasn't always that building. It was the first building open to the public and was open from January 1970 to September 1971 and was simply known as the Walt Disney World Preview Center. Now we know you. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. So when construction for New Fantasyland and Storybook Circus was being done at Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom, John Lasseter was given a tour of the area. And much like Walt, he is a train enthusiast, and he expressed his concerns to Imagineers that there wasn't any really good spot in the Magic Kingdom where guests could get a decent shot of the train and the cars. And he suggested that they build one in the New Fantasyland section. So the Imagineers listened and decided they would insert the area in front of the station located at Storybook Circus. And it cuts into a track a little bit, giving uh, a fantastic look at the train when it's at the station. It's perfect for photo opportunities, basically. And due to this idea coming from John Lasseter, the lookout area has become known as Lasseter Point by cast members and guests as well, you know, who work at Walt Disney World Railroad. So it's a nice little tribute to the guy who came up with the idea to begin with. Or he just stood around and pointed. That's true. He could do that. I mean, what is the Lassiter point? We all know what the Walt point is, but what's the Lassiter point? Hmm. Maybe that not. may be a, a topic to explore for Queen Nights. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't thinking like, you know, well, I was thinking like he points with his finger. Well, uh, isn't that how you're supposed to point? I guess. Unless with he uses his elbow. Isn't that the only polite way to point? With your elbow? Yeah. I'm going to start doing that now. I think we should. I think oh, that'll be, be the Communicore Weekly pointing on our own terms. I think that's our new handshake. Just... Pointing with her elbow. Pointing her elbows. Um, wow, so there was really no good segue except I was, maybe saying join That's why I kept the, going with that. I wanted to see how the segue was going to go. I was going to say, you know, you could join the train of winners. Come on, ride the train. Maybe. Woo-hoo. Ride oh. it. So we are talking about the year of a million or so limited time cadets weekly prize winner announcement because it's a week and we've got another prize <laughs> we winner do. to announce. Wow, so... Jeff, take it away. <laughs> so this week's winner is going to get a uh, a Disney prize pack from Fairy Godmother Travel. Thank you, Ooh. Teresa. And the winner for this week is Tobias M. from Garland, Texas. Yay. Congrats, Tobias. That is fantastic. So you might be asking yourself, how can you enter into our weekly prize drawing? If you aren't aware, just email us at communicorweekly at gmail.com with your name, address, and birthday so we can add you to the very large list of potential winners because we are pulling them. We've only got a handful, well, several handfuls left. <laughs> 30 something, right? We have math left, 34. Wow. Yeah, that's it, 34. 
That's incredible. So, all right, guys. Well, thank you so much for watching and listening to another episode of Communicore Weekly. Yeah, however you, you get the show, if you watch us on YouTube, leave a comment there, or if on iTunes, leave us a rating. We'd love to hear from you. Yep, and as I mentioned earlier, email us at communicoreweekly at gmail.com for your, tell us your thoughts, your concerns, your issues. Or whatever. Or PayPal us some money that way, right? <laughs> yeah, that works too. <laughs> yeah, we'll do that. Okay. Uh, you can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash communicoreweekly. And follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm at Imaginerding. He's at Jeff Heimbuck. You can also call us on the Communicore Weekly GOAT line at 424-785-4628. And visit the Communa store at CommunicoreWeekly.com where you can pick up some amazing shirts, including the Flushing on Our Own Terms t-shirt. But Yay. not the pointing on your own terms yet. No, we haven't gotten that one yet. I haven't gotten that one yet. <laughs> You can also uh, still get your official cadet membership card and stickers just by emailing or emailing, sending a self-addressed stamped envelope to Communicore Weekly, P.O. Box 432, Orange, California, 92856. And there's got to be a way to email a stamp to somebody. I'm sure there is a digital stamp out there. We just haven't got the technology here yet. We're working on it. Uh, speaking of working on it, if you'd like to help support the greatest online show, visit patreon.com slash Weekly to find out more. For Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck. Thanks so much for listening, guys and gals. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show.